have another speaker, and I'm excited to hear. I met, I met Dr. George last year in the mastermind group, and he had a lot of wisdom in that group. And I'm not surprised because he, he too, is a very accomplished man. He, he's on the Today Show. He's been on you know, a number of different um, TV stations, and he's connected with Ebony Magazine. He's married to Dr. Candace. You know, we're talking about where power couples rock. This is a power couple right here. And we heard a little bit earlier that he's got a lot of friends, you know. So I, I, I'm thinking that his personality, he's, he, he's got the kind of personality that just draws people to him. But he's also a licensed family therapist. And he works with couples and he works with people to help them um, deal with the situations that they have in their lives. And I'm excited because his topic tonight is one that I think will also hit home. Emotional inheritance from despair to legacy. Give it up for Dr. George J. October 30th, 2016 was supposed to be a good day. My wife had a conference that was going to be in December uh, in Denver and I had to drop her off at the airport. And then I was going to come back home and spend some time with my kids because my kids had a birthday party later on that day. So that's what we did. We got up early, dropped her off at the airport, came home, and was hanging out on the couch watching some cartoons. Probably Doc McStuffins or you know, Puppy Dog Pals or one of those cartoon shows we were watching. Then I get a phone call that I'll never forget. It was the nursing home calling me to say that my father had died. There I am on the couch with my kids, having to now learn that my father is no longer alive. I didn't know what to do at that moment, so I took myself upstairs in the bathroom and just tried to have a moment. Came back down, and my wife is on this five-hour flight, and I know she's on the flight, but I want to connect with her. So I call her multiple times because I want her to know what just happened. Can't get her. She lands at the time that I think she would land, and I keep calling her, but I still can't get her because her phone's on airplane mode. I call my mother-in-law, who's on her way to church, and her phone's on vibrate. Now, if anybody knows my mother-in-law, she usually has her phone on a setting I call siren. It just blasts loud throughout the household so everybody can hear it. But this day, it's on vibrate. And she goes to church, and she doesn't get my message for throughout the whole day. So I'm there with my kids on the couch, wanting to connect with someone, being married, having family, having friends, but I couldn't get anybody. I don't know about anybody out there, have you ever had a moment where you were connected? You knew you had family, you had friends, you had people in your life, but you felt alone. I was alone in that moment, and that's when despair hit in. All by myself, having to deal with the thought that my father wasn't alive. Now, I've been a caregiver for almost 10 years. And what I mean by caregiver, my wife and I have been taking care of both of my parents, because they both had dementia. My father had frontal temporal dementia, and my mother has Alzheimer's. We were actively in the household dealing with all the things that that meant. On a given day, that could mean wiping my son's butt because he had just pooped, and then going to wipe my dad's butt because he had just pooped. My five-year-old son would be happy that I just worked poop into this talk. <laughs> it also meant bringing them to the doctor's appointments, taking care of their medication, making sure that bills were paid, doing all types of things, including all the emotional stuff that meant as they worked through all of that. Both parents in the house, any moment could be crazy, not to mention everything else we were doing in our life. And now, my father was no longer alive. I thought maybe the caregiving was over. I thought that that was it. But no, I still had to do more. I had to figure out all these funeral arrangements with the help of my wife and mother-in-law. I had to take care of all these difficult, different, different things, which meant I had to do this, what I felt, by myself. My sister couldn't help. She wasn't in that position. I had to do it. So much so that the person who was helping us with the funeral thought he understood the situation, that we were going to get money and take care of it. Uh, but then he started to add some pressure. The morning of the funeral, I'm going to the bank to get the last check to make sure that I could pay for the funeral. I start to wonder, why do I have to still pay? Why am I still putting out more even after my father's death? A time when I was hoping that I would have an inheritance. I would have something because of his death. 
but I didn't. That's how I felt. I had nothing at that moment. And not on top of that, I had an extra burden. We didn't have the money. We didn't know where the money was coming from, but we had to find a way. And please forgive me, I was not going to do a GoFundMe page. I was not going to ask for help because I suck at asking for help. That is not me. It's something I struggle with and had to work through over and over. How do I ask for help? Much less, how do I ask for money? That was not going to be me. So I'm doing all these things to make sure I could figure it out. Once again, I don't know how many of you have ever tried to work so hard to figure something out and be at the place where you feel empty-handed. That's where I felt at that moment. And I started to go from despair to anger. I started to ask God, why? Why, God? Where is my inheritance, God? That's what I was hoping for in that moment because I felt it, I didn't have it. I didn't have anything because then I got back to the scripture, Proverbs 13, 22, that says a righteous man or a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. But I didn't feel that. I didn't see that. I thought it wasn't there. As we know, God likes to play tricks on people. I found that God asked me, or God told me, that you do have your inheritance. I don't know, anybody ever watch, you know, Three's come, uh, uh, Different Strokes, where Arnold goes, what you talking about, Willis? I, that's how I felt with God. What you talking about, God? I didn't have an inheritance. I have this extra burden on top of everything else I've had to do for the care of my parents. So God led me down and saying that you're just not seeing it clearly. I still didn't want to believe it. And as I thought about it more, I realized, okay, maybe there's something to it. You know, when I was in college, I had the opportunity to go see The Lion King. It was the number one show on Broadway at that time. And I got tickets for $25. I could not believe it. Nobody could get to see The Lion King. But I got tickets for $25. You know, I knew it wasn't, it wasn't going to be orchestra. It wasn't going to be right there. But I was in the building. I was so excited. I got up to the seats. I got in. I sat down. And there was this big pole in front of me. They gave me what is called an obstructed view seat. I couldn't see clearly. I couldn't see the stage. I had to either move to the left or to the right to see what was in front of me. God was telling me that my view was obstructed. I couldn't see clearly. The inheritance that I was hoping for wasn't there. But the inheritance that I received was. I received an emotional inheritance. Let me tell you a little bit more about my father. My father is from Jamaica, both of my parents. And I'm not talking about Montego Bay, Jamaica, jumping off the river uh, into the beach, Jamaica, on the, on the cliff, Jamaica. I'm talking about rural Jamaica. I'm talking about where you got goats on the side of the street. The lights get cut off at any moment. You don't even know if you got water, Jamaica. My dad worked hard as a farmer, and both of my parents found a way to come to the US because they wanted to create a better life for me even before I was born. I was born in the United States that set a path for me that already would benefit me beyond my imagination. I was the first one in my family to go to college because they believed in education. And if we back up, my father was illiterate. He couldn't read, but he knew the benefit of education. On top of that, my father was an entrepreneur. And when I say entrepreneur for me, that's like how I call my dad. He was my Ralph Cramden. <laughs> Anybody ever watched The Honeymooners? Ralph Cramden always had an idea. He was going to solve every problem. It might not work out, but he had an idea. And that was my dad. It didn't always work out. <laughs> we probably lost more money with every attempt that he made. <laughs> but what I learned was the opportunity to try something, to go after something, to believe in something that I'm now doing. Because of that, because of what I learned from what he put out, I'm able to do that in my life. I recently received the biggest check I've ever seen in my life for doing what I'm doing right now. I'm able to do that because of the inheritance I gained from my father. My view was no longer obstructed to the left or to the right so you can see clearly. That's the difference of despair versus legacy. It is the thing that obstructs your view of what you can have. 
we've been talking about presence. Our presence can be obstructed. We might need to move to the left or to the right so that we can be in a better position to connect with God. Some of us, our views are obstructed in the way that we see our spouse. We only see the negative that they do. We only see the bad that they do, the times they didn't show up, the times that they've hurt us. But maybe if we just move a little bit to the left or to the right, we might see all the good that they do, how hard they work. Some of our marriages, our views are obstructed. We've been looking at it through the wrong lens. We've been challenged not to be good, but to be great. How can you be great if your view is obstructed? Sometimes we gotta move that thing that is blocking you out of the way. That is the biggest lesson that I learned. I believe in legacy, right? And when I talk about this, last year my daughter, who is now eight, but last year she was seven, went to a conference, came back, and asked her, do you want to start a t-shirt business? She said yes. In a matter of months, we were running a t-shirt business that now she was making money from, she wanted to tithe off of, she wanted to give to those who were in need, and reinvest back into the business. That's the legacy of my father. Whether he was successful or not, his granddaughter now has a business. His grandson started a, t a bow tie business as a result. We gotta change our view. If it's obstructed, you can get stuck. You can be angry. You can be hurt. You can be depressed. You can be in despair. But if we move the thing that obstructs our view, you, your marriage, your family, your business, your future can now be full of legacy. Thank you.